Can anything good come from pain, addiction, disease, or darkness that resides within? Can we be transformed? Can we find new hope for what we think is hopeless? What would happen if we were awakened to an idea that begins the work of restoration? What if that idea began to mend us? This idea begins to transform our pain and hurt into something useful, something beautiful. It can be done. Our lives can be reclaimed. Hey, Mountain. Good to see everybody. Hey, I like it when we can just say hello to everyone at each of our four campuses and online. Can we just greet everybody and say welcome to Edgewood, Abingdon, Mountain Road, Bel Air. Online, if you're joining us, glad you're with us. Feels like more one church that way. Well, it's Memorial Day weekend, right? When thousands of Marylanders spend 16 hours in the car to sit on the beach for 45 minutes, <laughs> right? Well, you're here, that's an important thing. Memorial Day, we spend a lot of time kind of looking back and uh, using our memory to think of things that aren't always pleasant but that are important to us. Not all memories uh, are good ones. And so in this series of Reclaimed today, we, we want to, to ask whether some of the most difficult memories and some of the most horrible things that have happened to us can be reclaimed in the hands of God. Reclaimed is this series, you know, where it's kind of building off this thing in, in uh, building or whatever, where you take old stuff, junk that's like worthless for the scrap heap, right? And then, and then you refashion it and make something cool or new out of it, right? And this is, of course, what God does so well with the pieces and the places and the parts of our life that we feel like are absolutely irredeemable or the, the most trash heap worthy, placing them in the hands of God and seeing just what he might do with that. And so we've talked about how God can, in fact, reclaim our pain. God can reclaim our pain. God can reclaim our, like, screwed up, dysfunctional, toxic church background. God can reclaim our dysfunctional families. We've talked about each of these. We, we talked last week, Jared had a very important um, um, message on how God can reclaim, like, our mental health challenges, like depression and anxiety. Next week, we'll talk about how we can reclaim our whole life, and we'll have that exciting baptism splash. Maybe that's your moment to get in the water. Today, we want to talk about how God can reclaim abuse. This is difficult uh, to talk about. It's a, it's a can of worms that probably none of us really gets excited about opening, including me. Uh, it's, it can be awkward, uncomfortable, but it's important. It's so important. In fact, a lot of times when churches, if they do anything with this, they just kind of mention it and then kind of quickly move to a punchline and, and move past it. But it can be like that 800-pound elephant in the room that we just don't talk about in families or churches. But you know what? We're going to talk about it because if the gospel of Jesus Christ has any meaning for us, it has meaning for the parts of our lives that are so dominant and important, and this is a huge area. Men and women and children all over are living in the shadows of pain and secrecy and shame as a result of some different kinds of abuse that have happened, and we simply have to talk about it. So let's go there together today. Whether this has touched your life personally or in your own experience or someone you love, it's all of us, whether through emotional abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, some kind of child or domestic abuse or sexual abuse. 40% of Americans have been touched directly by abuse in a personal way. You know, the number of American troops that we're kind of remembering, you know, passing before us, like the number of American troops Killed in Afghanistan and Iraq between 2001 and 2012, about 6,500 lives were lost. Good thing to remember on Memorial Day. But the number of American women who lost their lives to their male partners during that same time period, twice as many. You know, we don't often have a Memorial Day about that kind of thing. About 55% of North Americans are victims of sexual abuse. One in three females will be sexually abused by the time they reach adulthood. One in three. One, two, you. One, two, you. One, two, me. So this is us. This is, this is so real and pervasive and important. 
It's almost half of us dealing with this. And, and the reason it's so important is that it flies directly counter to the intention of God's design for us. That it, it, is, it is a direct strike. Abuse is a direct strike against the sort of nature of what God had in mind. When you go to the beginning of the Bible, the very first page is Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. It says that God created human beings in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them. Look at me and listen to me because somebody needs to hear this. First of all, you are created. You're not an accident. You were thought upon person and you're created in God's image and that God desires for you to be blessed. That was the plan from the, uh, the beginning. It's what, it's what the theologians call the imago Dei. The image of God is planted inside of every single person, every single human. And the image of God, the imago Dei there, is what gives us dignity and worth and value. Every single human being has inestimable value. Why? Because of how much money you make, because of your skin color, because of your family name, your financial portfolio, where you live. No, because you're created imago Dei, in the image of God. And what abuse does is it flies directly in the face of that. And it dehumanizes and attacks that dignity because of the entrance of sin into the world. That sin has taken up residence in the hearts of humans that God created in his image, and they don't always reflect that image, and so some become abusers, and some become the abused. And this is a direct attack on God and on his plan for instilling dignity and worth and value into every human being. And so you have Jesus saying very clearly in John chapter 10, verse 10, that our spiritual enemy, he calls him a thief. Satan's a thief whose purpose has an agenda, and it is to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus says, my agenda is exactly opposite, and that is to give us a rich and satisfying life. Or you might say a, a fully and abundant life. And there are people who have struggled with abuse, some of them listening to me right now, who say, I've, I do not feel that full, abundant rich, satisfying life, and it's because a, an enemy has stolen, and abuse is one of the tools that the enemy uses to steal. He's stolen your childhood, stole your joy, stole your dignity, and he kills. He kills off your hopes and your dreams. He kills off so many things inside of us as we become sort of numb and dead to, to life, and, and he destroys so many things about relationships. And Jesus says, I have come to give life. I want to give some good news today to anyone who struggles with any kind of abuse. Whether it was a long time ago or still in your life today, the good news is that there is hope in Jesus Christ. And we want to offer, offer some ways to let some light into painful areas of our lives today. Some light and some hope. Because we need it. Because if you struggle with abuse, very often it leads you to sort of a, a mindset that says there's just no way forward for me. This is as good as it gets. There's no way. And, and you, you, you start believing lies about yourself and what's true about the world because you don't know what's normal because of your experience. And you feel dead on the inside because you've had to sort of seal off parts of your heart because you can't, you have to protect yourself. And, and to people like us who feel there's no way and there's lies and there's deadness, Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth for those lies, and I am the life when you're feeling only deadness. Now, we only have time to sort of touch on this and aim ourselves, hopefully, in a positive and helpful direction as we think about abuse. Abuse is, well, I think, of, I think of Romans 13, where it sort of says, you know, take all the commandments of God when he said, I created you to bless you and to, uh, to live in dignity. You can sum up all of what God's desires are for us by saying, you know, love, love your neighbor as yourself. And he goes on to say, love does no harm to a neighbor. Well, abuse does harm. A neighbor. It harms someone, and it can take so many different shapes. So you might talk, for example, about emotional abuse. Emotional abuse is just sort of 
maybe the fallout of so many other kinds of abuse, whether it be physical or violent abuse, or any kind of way of controlling someone through language or force or power or sex or money or, or uh, indifference or uh, uh, head games or, or um, anything like that. It's a kind of emotional abuse and it deeply wounds people over time because of what it communicates about your dignity and your value. Proverbs 17, 22 says that a cheerful heart is like good medicine, like man, just as a beautiful thing and yet a broken spirit saps a person's strength. And I think so many times this is what abuse does to us. It sort of uh, saps us of our strength because we spend so much of our energy coping or figuring out how to make it all seem like it's okay that we have no energy left for that rich and satisfying life. Verbal abuse is sort of just one form of emotional abuse. It's like a lumberjack with, who's real skillful with the axe, who just knows the right way to lay it into that tree in that same spot where it cuts in deeply and blow after blow it goes till the tree falls. Some people are like that with their tongues. Psalm 52 says, your tongue plots destruction. It's like a sharpened razor, you who practice deceit. You love evil rather than good, falsehood rather than truth. You love harmful words, you deceitful tongue. This is the verbal abuse that sometimes slowly just goes away. It can be loud, it can be cursing, it can be yelling and screaming, it can be soft and subtle and passive aggressive like a silent knife that goes in with not a sound. It's the thing you say to hurt me because you want to hurt me, because you want to take me down a notch, because you want to belittle me, because you want to strip me away from my dignity and from my self-confidence or from my self-respect. And so we use slander and we use slurs and we use sarcasm, anything we can that will tear down, as opposed to Ephesians 4, which says God's people don't use foul and abusive language. Don't use it. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear. Everything you say is either an encouragement where you're putting courage in to someone or a decouragement. You're, you're literally discouraging someone, taking the courage out of them where they no longer believe they're who they were meant to be. So are your words encouraging or discouraging? Are your words based on grief or grace? And these are the things that add up over time like that acts in our soul. Some of us know firsthand what it's like to experience that kind of abuse. Sexual abuse is any time one uses another human being and mistreats them for their own sexual gratification or stimulation. I want to share a story from Scripture so that you will see uh, this isn't new. And because it does such a good job of laying out so many of the classic aspects involved in abuse of this kind that so many of us have in our families. And I'll warn you, it's a little long and it's not pleasant. I don't recall this being one of my Sunday school lesson materials when I was a child. But it's where we live, so let's turn to 2 Samuel 13, 1 to 22. We'll take some time to read through that together. And you just observe and listen and think. Now David's son, Absalom, had a beautiful sister named Tamar. And Amnon, her half-brother, fell desperately in love with her. Amnon became so obsessed with Tamar that he became ill. She was a virgin and Amnon thought he would never have her. But Amnon had a very crafty friend, his cousin Jonadab. Sometimes it's other members of the family that become involved together in abusive schemes. He was the son of David's brother, Shemaiah. One day, Jonadab said to Amnon, what's the trouble? Why should the son of a king look so dejected morning after morning? So Amnon told him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Well, Jonadab said, I'll tell you what to do. Go back to bed and pretend you're ill. Comes up with a plan immediately. When your father comes to see you, ask him to let Tamar come and prepare some food for you. Tell him you'll feel better if she prepares it as you watch and feeds you with her own hands. 
preparing a situation that would seem sort of normal and build trust and invite proximity, seemingly innocent enough on the surface. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be sick. There's deceit at the core of this. And when the king came to see him, Amnon asked him, please let my sister Tamar come and cook my favorite dish as I watch. Then I can eat it from her own hands. And so David, the father, agreed. Later, I would imagine he might have wished he had asked more questions. So he sent Tamar to Amnon's house to prepare some food for him. When Tamar arrived at Amnon's house, she went to the place where he was lying down so he could watch her make some dough. She was probably honored at that point to be asked. And then she baked his favorite dish for him, but when she set the serving tray before him, he refused to eat. Everyone get out of here, Amnon told his servants, and so they all left, and now they're alone. Then he said to Tamar, now bring the food into my bedroom and feed it to me here. She had no choice. So Tamar took his favorite dish to him. But as she was feeding him, he grabbed her and demanded, come to bed with me, my darling sister. No, my brother, she cried. Don't be foolish. Don't do this to me. Such wicked things aren't done in Israel. Where could I go in my shame? And you would be called one of the greatest fools in Israel. Please, just speak to the king about it, and he will let you marry me. But Amnon wouldn't listen to her. And since he was stronger than she was, he raped her. Then suddenly... Amnon's love turned to hate. He hated her even more than he had loved her. Get out of here, he snarled at her. No, no, Tamar cried. Sending me away now is worse than what you've already done to me. But Amnon wouldn't listen to her. He shouted for his servant and demanded, throw this woman out and lock the door behind me. And so the servant put her out and locked the door behind her. She was wearing a long, beautiful robe, as was the custom in those days for the king's virgin's daughter. But now Tamar tore her robe and put ashes on her head. She's in deep grief and mourning, and her beautiful adornment is now tarnished. She no longer sees herself as a daughter of the king. And then with her face in her hands, she went away crying. Her brother Absalom saw her and asked, is it true that Amnon's been with you? Well, my sister, keep quiet for now. Since he's your brother, don't you worry about it. And so Tamar lived as a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house with a secret. And when King David heard what had happened, he was very angry. And though Absalom never spoke to Amnon about this, he hated Amnon deeply because of what he had done to his sister. Again, not a pleasant story, but one that reminds us, many of us, wow, I'm, that's like so many parts of that are like what I've experienced. And a reminder that abuse is no respecter of persons. It happens to the king's family and to low families. And it always involves this kind of deception and lust and in a world that everybody says, as long as you love, it's okay. You know, it's like, no, no. When it's for yourself and not for the other, it's not okay. It's damaging and it's destructive and it's hurtful and it blows this family up. The sin that fascinates eventually assassinates. It's how it always happened. And both are wounded and shame-filled. And their life was changed in such a drastic way. It looks to me like this story ends in despair. You don't get a lot of good news coming out of this story. It ends there with a woman in desolation. And that's the story for a lot of people. And if that's where you are today, I want to just draw a couple of truths out of here. One, it reminds us this. Your darkest secret doesn't have to be your death wish. Your darkest secret doesn't have to be a sentence of death for you. The, the only person that she could possibly have talked to about this appears to be Absalom who comes and gives her the worst advice in the world. Well, think about what would happen to your brother if you said anything. Just keep it a secret, stuff it down. 
And it's the worst advice, but it's exactly what leads to this kind of desolation. Friends, we believe in the good news of Jesus Christ who rose from the grave when the light burst into that tomb. And that means that that, there is no dark tomb that his light can't burst into and bring healing. That includes includes the reclaiming of our abuse. And so it doesn't have to be a death sentence for you, even if it's a dark secret and you're living in desolation right now. We all have secrets. Some of us wild, some of us mild, but we all have secrets. And you might say, you know what, it can't be undone. Maybe that's true, uh, but you can still be reclaimed. You might say it's too big for me, but guess what, it's not up to you. And nothing, the scriptures say, can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so we can find hope today and maybe a new path today for the grace in our lives that can come in and do a healing work. It will be long, it could be difficult, but it's real. Your darkest secret doesn't have to be your death sentence. And the other thing that this story makes me think is that you're not defined by what happens to you. You're not, that does not define who you are, even though you feel like it does. You're defined by who you belong to. You are defined by who you belong to. Abuse is not the final word. God says, I get the final word on who you are. I made you imago Dei in my own image, in my own name. And Jesus Christ put, went to the cross, so he purchased you with his blood. And that means you belong to him. You give your life to him. What happened to you is horrible. What can happen because of Jesus is wonderful. This is the kind of church where we've, we want to be able to help each other through this stuff. We're not going to just go along and say like Absalom, listen, don't talk about this. And I know this is awkward and I know it's difficult. But the hope of Jesus is too good. And if it doesn't have something to say about abuse, then it's no gospel at all. Because the fallout that a lot of us are experiencing is really, really great. And so instead of just moving on to good news, I want to dwell just for a moment. I know this is painful, but maybe some of us don't fully understand some of the fallout of abuse of this kind. And if you do, it might do good to hear someone say something that you are experiencing precisely. Because some of the fallout includes things like feelings of powerlessness or a sense of betrayal that runs very deep. Or maybe sometimes we feel just deep anger, anger towards someone who did this to me, anger toward my family for not protecting me, anger toward myself for letting it happen, or some kind of deep hurt we feel. Or we deal with all kind of self-protective defenses that we've built up around our heart because it hurts so much we had to do something to survive, but now it has thrown off our way of relating or intimacy with everyone in the rest of our lives and from the way we choose a date or a spouse or talk to someone at a party. Our ability to trust is changed. Our ability to to, to bond with our own parents is disrupted. The way we relate to God and think of God, like after all, where was he? And many feel like they've lost their voice because, you know what, we said no. I didn't want it to happen. I told someone and still no one heard me. Maybe I don't really deserve a voice. And the deep sense of shame that grips you where you live with this dirty secret and we feel like damaged goods that mark us for life and so we just are forced to hide it in a sort of cloak of denial and not even admitting it to ourselves sometimes. And so we stuff the pain under the surface as we learn to cope. And the part of you that loves and trusts and latches on to people and enjoys intimacy and expresses joy and all that happy stuff is dying away slowly inside of you because we're more preoccupied with terror and memories and dreams and fear of rejection and a fear that we're deficient in somehow a way of not measuring up. And so we lose ourselves in the meantime in a pursuit of perfectionism or some kind of workaholism or lose ourselves in depression or addiction or substance abuse or eating disorders or some kind of sexual dysfunction or we'd struggle with ulcers or or some kind of backache or tight jaw or chronic headaches, all can be tied into some of the fallout of this, all under a cloak of depression that tells us we're helpless, we're unworthy, we're dejected, we're damaged, we're cheap, and we're so angry and we have this self-worth struggle that just tells us we're stupid and, and we sabotage ourselves and pull the rug out from under our feet all the time because we feel like if this is really who I am, then I don't deserve to have good things happen in my life. And all of that and so much more is what so many of of us struggle with and God weeps at it and we need to weep together about it. We need to say it's not right. It's not what God intends and there is hope in Jesus Christ out of that. 
God is the one who looks upon us when we feel like we're a, a, a reed ready to break or snap. And, he, and, he, and he's not going to just sort of ignore that. Isaiah 42 says, he will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He sees that you're about to go out. He will faithfully administer his justice in his time and his way. Th- this, this look at the cross of Jesus Christ is so much hope for us because it reveals the possibility of the reclaiming power of God to the worst that humans can do to one another. Jesus suffered that terrible abuse for our good. And when you feel like it seems that the cruelty of the world calls into question the proof of a loving God who's really in control, you look at the cross. And the cross doesn't exactly answer the question, why me? But it does answer another more important question. Am I loved with a resounding, profound proof of sacrificial love on your behalf and an evidence that not only does God love you, but God hates the sin and he hates what's happened in your life and he's deadly serious about not letting his creation succumb to the evils of this kind of sin. And that's why he allowed the ravages of sin and the wages of it to fall on his own son as he was abused on the cross, enduring our shame so we could be set free from all of it. We can be reclaimed. I want to just offer two sorts of maybe key words that will set us on a pathway toward life that's rich and satisfying like Jesus intends. Just two words to get us started and to open the door of hope and let some light in today where it needs to be let in so Jesus can reclaim us. The first word is the word honesty. Honesty. The most important thing, if you've been abused, is eventually to peer deeply into your own wounded heart and acknowledge what's there so you can move past some of the powerful forces of denial about what's happened and become a person who can let that truth surface so it can come up into the hands of the one who can reclaim it. Let the truth surface and say even the words, I have been abused. Honesty. There's such a powerful force at work when we're abused. Because of the shameful forces that go at work in our minds, a powerful force tells us with everything in us to turn our eyes away and pretend that things are fine. Because the pain is so great, we've got to survive. And so we find these ways to sort of get on with life as if nothing happened because we have to cope. It's not your fault, but it's what we all do when we get abused like this. But really, it's like trying to keep a beach ball under the surface. It takes so much energy, and it's so hard, and we're just like working everything we can to keep it from coming up. And, and, and at, at what we're saying is honesty is where you let it rise to the surface and admit this has happened so that the work of restoration can begin because it can't until we face the truth. It's hard. Honesty is hard because... Denial works for us because if, if, if I stay with denial, then I don't have to be honest enough about my anger at God. Or I don't have to, be, I don't have to deal with the possibility that if I said something about this it might, it, to me or anyone else, it, it might not reflect well on people that I want to hold in high regard. Or, or, or I, might, I might have to sort of admit that the reason I struggle in relationships today is, is tied to this. And it's hard because sometimes just bringing out our true self, like all of the shame and that, it, that I, to admit to, to God or anyone that I'm full of anger and I'm, I'm wounded and I'm lonely and I feel worthless and I've repressed these memories and I don't want to deal with that and I've suppressed these, these emotions and I don't want to have to deal with that. It's hard. And so we deal sometimes. We make a deal with ourselves to just leave well enough alone because it feels like we're going to get by okay But if you want to move forward, and I so hope you will believe that there is a better, rich, and satisfying, abundant life that Jesus has for you, then it begins with being honest enough to admit that some of that plan that we used to put up to cope is not working that well, and that we do want more, and that we're hungry, even though a part of us said, when that happened, I will never let myself want love or be loved again. And so we harden that off. And and if you can just admit that that's not working that well for you and that inside you're not okay, you can begin taking an honest step to be bold and brave enough to say, I've been abused in this way. 
The second step follows on it, grows out of it. And it might surprise you when I use this word, but I think a second step for anyone who's been abused is, is repentance. And by suggesting that you need to repent, what we're not saying is to a victim that anything that happened to you is your fault or that you need to repent of the abuse. No, 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 a thousand times no. You don't need to repent. It wasn't your fault. You didn't deserve it, no. But still, if you want to be completely free and reclaimed and whole and live the kind of life that you really can live, then repentance is in order for you to, because we have to eventually exchange all of those mechanisms we put in place to cope and survive and get by and depend on with a trust and a dependence on Jesus Christ. We need to turn from these things that we've put in place to get by to Jesus. And that turning is the word repent. It's a greater trust in God. Because along the way, it's not your fault. You figured out a way to cope and to sort of turn to other sources to get by and to protect and to fulfill your deepest longings. Or you just denied those longings were there because it hurt too much. And repentance is about daring to trust that God is good and admitting that we need Jesus and shift in where you look for safety and security, getting past some of the fear that has locked you up in a tomb that's killing you inside. Ultimately, repentance is a hungry, broken heart turning to God and admitting that I've been leaning on some other stuff other than you. And the Bible calls that idolatry, which is why we need to turn from it. And so we can let God in to even the broken places. You remember that story of the prodigal son that Jesus told about that boy who ran away from home. He thought he was going to be great. He thought it was going to be awesome. It turned out it wasn't so great. And eventually he comes to himself and he says, I'm eating garbage. This is terrible. I need to go home. He realized he was dissatisfied with the good life. And so he went home to the father knowing, fearing that he might face possible rejection, but he went anyway. And this is the move. This is the repentant move that an abused person needs to dare to take out of a broken heart, be dissatisfied enough with what you're doing to say, I, I, I'm not fully able to make my life work. I'm in a pig pen and I'm willing and to try trading in some of my stuff, my mechanisms here that I've depended on for real life in Jesus if he'll have me. And you turn toward home. And when that boy turned home, he had a father run to him, embrace him and throw a party and celebrate and his life got better and yours can too. Yours can too. And you'll meet a weeping, joyful father when you say, I surrender. This happened to me and I need help. I want to be able to love other people. I want to stop hiding. I want to stop playing the game. You can be reclaimed to intimacy and joy and self-respect and healthy relations. As you cry out for grace God delivers. But whatever you've put up in your heart, that wall of protection you put around because you knew you had to do something to survive. You think it's keeping you safe, but what it's doing is it's locking out real love and your ability to love others and you're even locking out your attachment to Jesus sometimes. So if you let that door open in that wall, the flood of Jesus' light will come in. And the same power that you saw raise him from the dead can start raising up dead places in you. You can be reclaimed. Let me offer just a couple of practical words to a few different people. We only have time to scratch the surface today, but hopefully aiming one another in helpful, hopeful directions. Let me say a word to someone who's listening who has perpetrated abuse against another you violated the dignity of some other creature of God. Whether it was through words or some other action. You need to know that you also can be reclaimed. And that nothing and no one is outside the reach of God's power and grace. Nothing and no one. Including you. The path forward is not easy or simple or quick. And it won't do merely to say I'm sorry and write a note and cry some tears and ask for forgiveness. There's more. But for you, the only path forward where you can have a real life 
other than living in denial or self-absorption or self-contempt is through the same avenues of honesty and repentance. Honesty and repentance. And don't allow your callousness or your money or your family or your protection that you have to build a wall around your heart that keeps you from real change. And if you're not doing everything you can to help, including financially, someone you've abused, then I don't think you're quite ready for this yet. A word to the non-offending parents. You found out that your child has been abused, and maybe they're an adult now or somewhere along the lines. Most cases, the parent who's not the abuser parent feels tremendous sense of guilt and self-contempt for not protecting or being there or for being ignorant about it all, and you feel profound anger at the abuser for not sharing more of the information and, at, and for the, the one who was abused even sometimes. I just want to encourage you to be aware of all those things, and they can hinder the process of change for your child. And it's not about you. It's about them. And this is a hard word, but I feel I need to say, if you missed some cues or you ignored evidence along the way, then you might ask yourself some deep questions about why your child was less important than whatever it was you were choosing to protect. Many non-offending parents need to be honest and ask hard questions about why you didn't intervene if you knew or couldn't have. And if there's no way you could have known, you need to also be honest about that. And also in your own repentance, turn to the Lord for your hope and your healing, as difficult as this would be. You'll have your own heartache to deal with. I strongly recommend a support group and some help, and we've got some of those at Mountain. A word to the spouse of someone who's been abused. You have a difficult role. Your spouse, maybe you didn't even know when you got married, but you know now, and you've got an important place to play to provide stability and strength and encouragement and long-term friendship to hang in there, be informed, read books, know what's going on, and, and know that it's going to have an impact on your intimacy. It's going to be frustrating. It's going to be hard. Don't blame your spouse. Don't attack them. Do your best to be patient and know that God is using you in an amazing project of reclamation. It's okay to have righteous anger toward the person who abused your spouse, but don't get swallowed up in that bitterness or you'll become part of the problem. Same path for you. Honesty, repentance, keep turning to God. A word to the friend of someone who's been abused. You've, you've learned that one of your dear friends or close friends has been abused and there's a part of you that maybe wants to run the other direction. Just like, get me out of here. But real friends, as you know, hang in there, even through the frightening terrain of this kind of stuff. As you deal with a messy, wounded heart, that's what friendship does. And you will probably say some wrong things along the way, but that's okay. You're not their savior, but you can be their friend. And one the savior will use to help you just provide encouragement and remind them they're not worthless, to give them a voice, to give them some ears, to help them know it was not their fault and that they can be reclaimed through the power of Jesus Christ. So just hang in there. You have an important role to fill if you've got someone in your life that has been abused. And a word to the abused. If you've been damaged in any of these ways we've talked about and you feel like there's part of you that's just worthless, you can be reclaimed to the rich and satisfying life that God has. It will never go away. It will never be all gone and fixed and made up right. I don't have easy answers. I don't have a magic pill, but I do have good news that the gospel of Jesus Christ can reclaim you in this area of your life and there is hope and there is more waiting for you. We need to see examples of that, and that's why I would like for you to, to hear Kristen's story. Go ahead and watch the screen. My story is one of hope and redemption. I experienced sexual abuse and trauma um, in middle school and through high school. And it's part of my story, but it doesn't define who I am. I got really involved in extracurricular activities, sort of as a way to escape a lot of what was happening at home. I could go to school and then I could go um, and participate in extracurriculars and didn't really have to be very present. And it was through those extracurricular activities that I experienced abuse um, at the hands of adults who 
really were there to be protecting us. What I did struggle with was worthlessness. Um, profound and at times debilitating feelings of worthlessness. And I'm not gonna lie, I still really struggle with that today. The difference is I know what to do with those feelings. I kind of continued through middle school and high school, doing well in school, doing well with my friendships and my other relationships. And then I met my husband and I was 18, we got married and we had our son. But then everything started spiraling out of control in our life. And I just thought that it was what I deserved. Um, and when you don't think that you have value or worth, you it's hard to describe worthlessness, feelings of worthlessness to someone who doesn't experience it. It's almost just like it's part of who you are. I have red hair, I have blue eyes, I'm worthless. I mean, it's just part of what makes you, you. And it's, it's almost gets to a point where it's not a sad thing anymore. It just is what it is. I did start feeling Jesus call me and pull me. And I felt this urge to just run towards him as fast as I could. And I, I sought him. I sought a relationship with him in the church. And eventually that led us to Mountain. I wanted so badly to have this freedom that I saw in others. So I prayed about that. And then God, as he does, did a lot of work for me and put me in situations where I had to share my story. I started um, participating in groups and Bible studies and exploring stuff on my own, spending time in the Bible every day. And I just realized how loved I am just for existing just knowing that we have a God who just loves us and whose heart breaks for us when we're experiencing abuse or trauma or crisis. It's not what he wants for us. And coming to the realization that there is more power in giving that trauma to God than holding it. Abuse is, is powerful. Experiencing trauma is powerful. If you keep it inside, it can wreck you. It can just destroy your life. It's that powerful. But God is so much more powerful than that. And when we give that trauma and that abuse to Him, what He can do, how He can turn that and change that and use that for the glory of His kingdom is so much more powerful than what could happen just to us. Not only can we be restored and reclaimed, but God can use that then to help others who have experienced the same thing. So, yeah. I know that some hearing that right now, you hear Kristen's story and as a part of you, you're just terrified because the thought of talking about it in that way just scares you to death. There's probably another part of you that wonders if what happened in her life could happen in yours. And that's, that's a crack, that's an opening. And Jesus will take it. He's calling you, just as he called her, and he's calling me, he's calling all of us to himself. And I hope you'll sense that in this moment. Whatever your issue, particularly abuse, honesty and repentance, honesty and repentance. And you don't have to do this alone. And it doesn't have to happen in one day but begin a journey toward wholeness. We're gonna stand right now at all of our campuses, if I can have you do that. And we're gonna sing a song together, and, and even in this song, we're gonna have friends at the front of all of our campuses. If you wanna just come for prayer today, just have someone begin to pray with you about something in your life that's related to this, or maybe in the coming weeks when you're ready in your time. Or maybe you wanna stop by our table out here and talk about one of the care groups, one of the support groups, one of the... That, that relates to everything from domestic violence to sexual abuse to all kinds of things and groups that could be of help just to come together with some others. Maybe that's one of your steps. So right now, let's, let's turn our hearts in a spirit of honesty and repentance to the Lord as we, as we prepare to sing. God, we thank you for this good
good word. We thank you that we can be a church that can talk about stuff like this. It's not easy. It's not pleasant. I wish some ways we would, would skip it. But God, also, we just thank you that you speak into every dark corner of this world and including our own lives. And so we thank you for the hope that's been planted today and for the lives that will be changed as a result. And all of God's people said, amen. amen.